This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. Hey, uh, just a minor note, uh, I am only posting the first half of this podcast uh, because it is a monologue. Um, I'm not going to ungate the whole thing. Uh, If you want to listen to the full podcast, please go to rizib.substack.com and uh, subscribe. Hey, everybody. Uh, This is Razib Khan with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And today I am going to be talking about three papers uh, in Science Magazine that came out on the Indo-European question, uh, the Southern Arc Hypothesis. Uh, the papers are um, mostly out of the David Reich's lab, although they had a lot of collaborators uh, on these papers, so, uh, you know, more power to them. Uh, the papers are The Genetic History of the Southern Arc, A Bridge Between West Asia and Europe, The Genetic Probe into the Ancient and Medieval History of Southern Europe and West Asia, and uh, Ancient DNA from Mesopotamia Suggests Distinct Pre-Pottery and Pottery Neolithic Immigrants into Anatolia. Um, I'm not going to talk about the last paper too much uh, because I think it's a much narrower scope uh, than the first two papers, but um, it's interesting as it is, and it points to the fact that these papers are really, really centered around Anatolia. Anatolia, also known as Asia Minor, today the modern nation of Turkey. Um, It was the heartland of the Byzantine Empire for many, many centuries. Uh, Before that, there were, you know, other people like the Lydians. Um, and the Hittites, and we're going to get into the Hittites. So it's a very ancient part of the world. Uh, a lot of history has happened, and that's one of the reasons why we're talking about it. Um, so the Southern Arc basically uh, seems to me, um, as Yosef Lazaridis and his uh, co- um, co-authors describe it, um, is uh, basically the Eastern Balkans uh, into Anatolia, into the Caucasus region. So the Caucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Really, it's kind of the southern two thirds of the Black Sea, uh, you know, so uh, the western coast, the eastern coast, and the southern coast, but not necessarily the northern coast, uh, which is uh, that north of that is the Pontic Steppe, which we will also talk about. And so the southern arc uh, hypothesis, the southern arc model, basically posits that this region of the world was really, really a big deal uh, in terms of the ethnogenesis and the emergence of the Proto Indo European. Uh, languages and the Proto-Indo-European people. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little reluctant here using terms like Indo-European because they also use terms like Indo-Anatolian. Um, there is some arguments whether the Anatolian languages, uh, Hittite, uh, the Hittite language, um, was I think the the language's name for for the Hittites themselves is is Nasili. Um, they are from the city of Nessa. So I just want to make a distinction between the exonym and the ethnonym for you nerds out there. Uh, so they didn't call themselves Hittites. They were the people of Nessa. Um, Hittites is uh, a name that derives from the Hatti, a pre-Indo-European people that were dominant in central Anatolia in the 3rd millennium BC. Uh, and then there's also the um, the Luawans uh, to their south, mostly. Uh, Peleans to their north. And then to their west, like in the corner, there are Lycians, I think. Uh, and so these languages are the Anatolian languages. And there are no Anatolian languages left today. They all went extinct. Uh, They were absorbed with Hellenization during the Iron Age. Uh, But they were a big deal during the Bronze Age. And the earliest written Indo-European that we have is Hittite. Um, They adopted the Akkadian cuneiform script, and they used it uh, for their language, I think, 1950 BC, if I remember correctly. Uh, So that's really, really early. Um, And uh, the issue um, at the heart of these papers is uh, several years ago, they got some samples from uh, from um, Hittites. It lo- they were buried in a way that seemed like these people were Hittites archaeologically, so you assume that they are Hittites. They are Nessa, not people from Nessa, uh, not Hatti. And these two samples uh, were interesting because, um, you know, in 2015 and the last couple of years, uh, basically between 2015 and now, a bunch of papers have shown a strong correlation between uh, Pontic steppe ancestry from the Yamnaya people. Yamnaya means pit grave in Russian, uh, because they met, buried their elites in pit graves with vast mounds called kurgans. And um, all of the Indo-European peoples seem to have uh, this sort of steppe ancestry. 
And, you know, you kind of saw this even before you had ancient DNA. Uh, I, I think I've said this to many people, and I'll say it again. Um, about, uh, I don't know, 2010, I started noticing a weird pattern of a, uh, in admixture analysis, which is model-based uh, clustering, you use these populations, these ancestral populations, and you see how uh, um, you know different populations or linear combinations of these ancestral populations. Uh, a Caucasus-type ancestry, Caucasian-type ancestry, uh, seem to be more prevalent among Indo-European speakers than non-Indo-European speakers in particular localities. So, for example, if you compare Basques uh, to their French neighbors... Or their Spanish neighbors, Basque are not into European language. I thought that was suspicious. Uh, in the Indian subcontinent, you started, you could see this contrast as well. This Caucasus type ancestry um, was present in the north and the west, in upper caste population. And then you also saw uh, some association with Northeast European clusters in the Indian subcontinent, particularly again the north and the west and upper caste populations. This is all weird, okay? So it's also, but it's all suggestive until you had ancient DNA. And what happened? Um, I think it was like 2013, 2014. Uh, David Anthony, an archaeologist, gave a bunch of samples to David Reich's lab. They genotyped them, and they were shocked that these people from Russia, I think some of them were sampled from Russia, uh, and some of them were sampled from basically the eastern half of Ukraine, uh, east of the Dnieper. Uh, the, the Yamnaya people did push west, but really their core is between the Dnieper and the Don River. So they span Ukraine and Russia, modern Ukraine and Russia, the Pontic steppe. The ancestry of these people is just found all over the world, okay? Um, uh, Europe, uh, Iran, the Indian subcontinent, Mongolia. I mean, I, I did like a back of the envelope calculation. And uh, this is in my sub stack. You can find it in the archives. I think I estimate like well, about like 10% of the world's population um, has Yamnaya. Like pure, like if you talk about like pure Yamnaya, whatever that is, 10% of the world's population has that, right? Uh, from the Indian subcontinent to Europe to, you know, diaspora populations in the New World, et cetera, et cetera. Just, I ran the math, I did a weighted calculation, and that's what I got. So this was a big deal, uh, and it was a big deal because it uh, vindicated and validated uh, the crazy ideas of this woman named Maria Gimbutis, a Lithuanian-American archaeologist, uh, mentor, uh, an advisor to people like David Anthony, J.P. Mallory. She had this idea that these Kurganmans, which... So these big, big mounds that started spreading about 5,000 years ago uh, from the Pontic steppe into Europe, uh, that they were somehow associated with the spread of Indo-European languages, uh, patriarchal sky god systems, uh, into a matriarchal Europe, what she called Old Europe. So she was partly wrong and partly right. Uh, in fact, she was very, very wrong and very, very right. There was actually no mildness in between here. The very, very wrong part is she thought that the Old Europeans were matriarchal and peaceful. And it was the age of Aquarius. But actually, we have plenty of evidence now from Neolithic Europe that they were extremely brutal, patrilineal, um, and that they engaged in genocide and internecine warfare. Like, we're talking a butchery of whole villages of people of the same broad ethnic, right? So, um, you know, there's mass burials of children, women, men, everybody, old, young, you know, babies, etc., of these old Europeans, these Neolithic people. The earliest is uh, the Linear Potter people in Germany. Uh, the people that created Stonehenge in in, um, in England, and a lot of these these enormously uh, complex village societies in Europe, uh, between five to six thousand years ago, really they peaked about like five thousand five hundred years ago or so, and um, they kind of went into a crash about five thousand years ago. And this is exactly the same time as the Kurgan people came. Now David Anthony and uh, perhaps even Gambutas herself assumed that this was spread of an elite culture. Uh, kind of like how, I don't know, um, Spaniards spread Roman Catholicism in the Philippines, or Islam spread uh, by was spread by Gujarati and Arab traders in Indonesia. Uh, there was not that much genetic imprint, but there was a huge cultural imprint. And so the assumption was, and if you read the horse wheel of language, um, it's pretty clear that maybe a couple of percent of the ancestry is replaced, but um, you know this awesome new cultural package spread, and it was through conquest by this martial elite. It turned out this was wrong. Uh, the ancient DNA is quite clear that in much of Northern Europe, they replaced the indigenous Neolithic population who were uh, very, very um, violent and warlike, as I know, you know, but the incomers, the newcomers themselves were violent and warlike. Uh, there is evidence in Poland of uh, mass graves, uh, probably of the native globular amphora people and the incoming Yamnaya. And, uh, you know, uh, 
<laughs> two go in and one comes out kind of thing, right? Uh, it's animal competition uh, in this in this period of history. So it was pretty shocking to David Anthony. It was shocking to most archaeologists. It was shocking to the geneticists. So we're talking replacement on the order of about three fourths or two, to two thirds to three fourths in Northern Europe uh, within a couple of, within a century or so. Uh, so that's a massive replacement. Instead of one or two percent, we're talking sixty-five to seventy-five percent, and this is all across northern Europe. Uh, it it kind of dilutes as you go uh, westward. So you're, you know, by the time you hit France, it's getting closer to fifty percent. In Spain, it's closer to like forty percent, etc. But I mean, that's still a lot. That's still a lot of ancestry. It's still a lot of heritage uh, for late Neolithic, early Bronze and Copper Age people to just bowl over entire populations like that. So this was Europe. Um, there's also the issue of the Indian subcontinent, and uh, you know there's a paper in Nature Communications called Saga et al. 2020. You guys should look at it. Uh, you know I'll put it in the show notes. Basically, it shows a pretty uh, clear transect of Indo-Iranian people from basically the region of the Pripet Marshes, Eastern Corded Ware populations. Um, and I've talked about this. Most of you guys know this. Uh, they go eastward along the the wooded steppe woodland. Uh, north of the Pontic Steppe, south of the Boreal Forest, where there are Uralic people. <clears throat> they keep going eastward. They eventually hit the Urals, and in the South Urals, they became this highly militarized people called Sintashta. Again, they start killing each other. And then they start expanding into something called the Andronovo Horizon uh, after about 1800 BC. And eventually, um, it looks like they come to Iran and the Indian subcontinent. And so, uh, depending on your estimate, um, you know, I, est I estimate that about, what is it, like 15% of the total ancestry in the Indian subcontinent is from these Sintashta people. And so what I did is, again, I broke down the ethnic groups and the caste, and I did like rough numbers. I think 15% is, is okay. It could be 10%. Um, I doubt it's above 15 So let's say 10 to 15%. Now, this is a very small minority. But here's the thing. Um, there's a lot of people in the Indian subcontinent. So uh, that's still a substantial number. In the Northwest, it gets much higher, uh, you know, like closer to 25%. In some castes, it's maybe 30 Again, it depends on the parameter settings of these models. People argue over a lot of things. But really, what they're arguing over is like 5%. It's not really, to my, in my opinion, it's not really worth it, right? So, you know, this was all a big deal, like going from the Bay of Bengal to the Atlantic. We've solved Indo-European question and Indo-Europeans. Um, uh, they're from the Pontic Steppe, right? And who are these people? Uh, David Anthony has written extensively about it. Um, other people have as well. There's books on Indo-Europeans you can find. Um, it looks like they are a mishmash, a mix of indigenous Northeast European hunter-gatherers. They're called Eastern hunter-gatherers. And um, basically uh, people maybe from the Caucasus region to the south. Caucasus hunter-gatherers, like very, very original, right? This is the original thought. And so Eastern hunter-gatherers have some affinity to the, to the Ice Age people in, um, uh, Ice Age people in uh, Europe, in Western Europe, right? Uh, but they're, they're also much clo more closely related to people in Siberia, uh, ancient North Eurasians. So, um, you know, it seemed like the solution was, was in these ancient people, Eastern European hunter-gatherers uh, with Caucasus hunter-gatherers. They fused sometime before five th or 3000 BC, um, and then they eventually expanded across the world. Uh, but there's a problem. So this signature is found everywhere, pretty much, uh, where they in the early period where they speak Indo-European languages, right? And it's, it's associated with particular Y-chromosomal lineages, uh, particularly R1B and R1A. Uh, these are obviously Paleo-Siberian lineages that spread westward and later spread all over the place, okay? It's pretty. It's a pretty airtight solution to the issues at hand. But there's a problem. Uh, there's a couple of Nessa uh, from Nessa, right? Uh, these are these are Nessite people, Hittites. We know they're Indo-European because we got their language earlier than any other Indo-European language. And they don't have any steppe ancestry, right? And I think there's like a couple of samples. And I remember talking to a friend of mine in the Reich lab, uh, and I was like, "What's going on with these samples? Like, there's no steppe ancestry. They're Indo-European. They're very early. They should have a lot of steppe ancestry." And um, you know. He said, well, we wonder if there's a sam sample mix-up. And that happens. That happens. You know, related to this, there's a paper about Polynesians before 1492 in Brazil. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess I'll just say it here. My old boss, Spencer Wells, uh, was privately was just like, uh, that could be a sample mix-up. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, samples being tested in the world. 
uh, from museums. And a lot of it uh, could be, you know, not a lot, but some of them are going to be sample mix-ups. And those are going to be very, very interesting uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so, you know, it's not a crazy idea. Uh, but uh, these two papers... Uh, the two papers in particular um, that I mentioned earlier, The Genetic History of the Southern Ark, A Bridge Between West Asia and Europe, and A Genetic Probe, The Ancient Medieval History of Southern Europe and West Asia, um, they basically confirm there's no way this is a sample mix-up because uh, I think the total number of like new samples is like 700 or something ridiculous, um, ancient DNA. But they have a lot of Anatolian samples, samples from Asia Minor, Anatolia, from these core old Hittite lands, they don't have steppe ancestry. Like, what's going on here? And uh, as I said, the Anatolian languages themselves are not just one. Uh, it's not just Hittite. It's not just the Nessite language. Uh, there's Palauan, uh, Luawan to the south, and then uh, Lycian. Uh, yeah, it's Lycian. And there's some suggestion that maybe Lydian from the Iron Age is a descendant. Uh, these Anatolian languages did persist actually into the Common Era or Christian Era, depending on what you want to say. Uh, there are still some people that were speaking them but uh they really faded in the iron age but by the end of the bronze age they were the dominant languages before uh hittite was the dominant language in central anatolia though the local people were called hatti so what the term hittite is from they spoke a non-indo-european language no one it's, it's an isolate it's not related to anything else and so we have in this area of the world a lot of linguistic diversity so to the east of the core hittite zone there's stuff like the kingdom of urartu um, there's a lot of non-Indo-European language speakers to the south of the Luawan zone, so the Hurrians. That's not Semitic. Uh, it's not uh, Indo-European. It seems to be related to the language of Urartu. Uh, there's almost certainly, like, besides Hatti, there were other non-Indo-European speakers uh, in Anatolia. So I think that the Kaska, the kingdom of Kaska to the northeast of the, uh, basically where Trabzon is today, right? The northeast Turkey. So this is a really linguistically diverse area, and there's a lot of Indo-European languages. And one thing you see with the expansion of Indo-Europeans elsewhere is, like, they replace a lot of the diversity and they absorb the substrate, right? So, like, what's going on here? So uh, there have been Russian, in particular, there have been, like, Russian uh, historical linguists and philologists who have argued that actually the Indo-European languages may have spread from Anatolia. Uh, this was actually picked up by Colin Renfrew, the archaeologist. Uh, and he argued in the 70s that Indo-European is a, is a language that was spread by agriculture to Europe uh, with the first farmers, and that's why it's so dominant. That, that's probably almost certainly wrong, like 99.99%. The first farmers are from Anatolia, but, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't look like they're associated with the spread of Indo-European. It looks like they're associated with the spread of something else. Uh, you know, like the Pontic Steppe thesis looks more plausible. Uh, than uh than this older idea of really ancient spread, right? Um, but there was still the possibility that the Pontic Steppe might have been a secondary spread zone. Uh, that Indo-European originally came from elsewhere, and then it really spread via the Pontic Steppe. So think about um the Germanic languages. They're all over the world right now. You know, it's uh Germanic languages are the dominant second language in the world, right? But it's not German. It's not Norwegian. It's not Swedish. Uh, it's not from the core germanic zone uh it, i'm talking about english uh english spread to, to britain uh pertain right uh the land of the britons the britanni uh and it overwhelmed the island and then eventually england became a colonizer nation a settler nation and it spread this uh br this uh i don't want to say marginal but this atypical germanic language all across the world and so my point here is you know, we know where the Germanic languages kind of come from in Europe. They come from maybe the Jutland, southern Scandinavia, northern Germany area, probably. Uh, they probably come out of the Corded Ware Zone, um, you know, thousands of years ago. I think the Una Unesta culture, I can't pronounce it. Anyway, um, we kind of have an idea. Uh, they don't come from England. England was probably not Germanic. I don't care what Stephen Oppenheimer says, but, you know, that's where they spread to all across the world. And so there was always a suggestion that maybe the Pontic Steppe is like that. I'll cut to the chase and say that this is pretty much what Yosef Lazaridis and his co-authors believe. Um, they now are claiming this is not a case closed, okay? I, I want to be clear about this because people are very, very emotionally involved. Uh, I don't know why. Well, I kind of know why, but I don't want to get into that. But, you know, this is... This is like a serious, creditable argument. It's not crazy, okay? Um, but they believe, uh, Lazaridis and his co-authors believe that the Indo-European language probably spread from maybe eastern Anatolia, the Caucasus, maybe northwest Iran, 
They don't have perfect sampling, so they're not 100% sure. And they think that it spread westward into Anatolia, into central and western Anatolia, okay? And then it spread northward 5,000 years ago into the Pontic Steppe. And from the Pontic Steppe, it spread into a lot of different places. Um, and that's why the steppe ancestry is all over the place. Whereas in Anatolia, there's no steppe ancestry because these Indo-Europeans did not go via the steppe. They went straight from the Caucasus or whatever to the east of Anatolia region they're from into Anatolia. And so within the Indo-European linguistic phylogeny, um, there is there is a thesis that uh, the Indo-European languages, Anatolian languages split out first. So that's why the term Indo-Anatolian exists. So it's an outgroup. If you guys think in terms of phylogenetic, this is this is where actually like this podcast should be on YouTube for once. But uh, in any case, um, uh, Anatolian is the outgroup. It's the basal uh, order, like, um, you know, with Hittite and all these. And there's a lot of Hittite. We have a lot of Hittite tablets. Most of them have not been translated because no billionaire has decided to fund it. Like billionaires, think about it. There's a lot of untranslated Bronze Age tablets. In any case, um, so we have a lot of documentation. Like the Anatolian languages are clearly outgroups uh, uh, compared to all the other Indo-European languages. So let's like name off the name off the families, right? We got Anatolian, we got Tokarian, which is extinct. Uh, it was in Xinjiang mostly. The um, historically, it's in the northeast corner, Turfan, in that area. Um, and then uh, you have Indo-Iranian. Um, these are Indian Indian languages, Indo-Iran, Indo-Aryan languages, and Iranian language are clearly <clears throat> a natural sister clade. OK, uh, in terms of like, there's no debate about that. Um, and then you have Balto Slavic. There's a little bit of argument about this uh, because some people say, oh, it could be just like lexical exchange, like, you know, instead of like real genealogical connection. Who cares? Whatever. There are some people who argue that Balto Slavic and Indo-Iranian uh, are a clade. Uh, a lot of historical linguists disagree with this. I think it's probably right because these two lineages historically share the same Y chromosome. Uh, dominant Y chromosomal lineages, R1A, where it's like the diverged mutation between the two branches, dates to about 3,500 BC or so, 5,500 years, right? Uh, so I think that that's plausible. Um, and then you have Celtic, Italic, that might be a clade, although that's more tendentious. And then you have Germanic, obviously, uh, Greek, Armenian, and then you have the weird Illyrian ones like Albanian and extinct ones like, like Thracian and stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, so you have all of these Indo-European languages. One thing... um. One thing that this new model suggests, though, is uh, basically, in some way, all of the Indo-European languages, except for the Anatolian ones, are probably connected to the steppe. Uh, they're probably connected to the Pontic steppe. Um, and the Pontic steppe itself, uh, uh, Lazaridis et al., um, I kind of agree with him here, and I had thought this before. There are several daughter cultures out of the Yamnaya. So the Yamnaya are about this 50-50 mix between Caucasus hunter-gatherer, like West Asians, and indigenous Northeast Europeans, right? And uh, But they they spread out and mix with other people or don't. So uh, there's a culture in the Altai uh, in Mongolia called the Afanasivo that shows up like a century. It's like 3,100 BC, really early. Uh, they, they have no mixture with any of the intervening populations. It's like they just took their carts and went straight east until they hit the Altai pastures. They are carbon copies of the Yamnaya of the Pontic Steppe. Um, I think like the David Anthony has claimed that I think he's on a paper that will come out at some point with many, many more Yamnaya samples. Um, they found relatives of people in the Altai to people in Western, like in Hungary and stuff. Like basically they're cousins, right? So these are one Yamnaya people, these nomadic people. Um, some of them seem to have gone north and west into the woodland zone, uh, modern day Belarus. Poland, you know, that like area of Russia, south of Novgorod. Um, and they became the courted wear people. And that's basically, I mean, read, if you read my Substack, I have a post on them. But basically, it's their pottery. Uh, the idea is their pottery is actually recapitulating baskets uh, because, you know, uh, nomadic people have baskets. They don't have pottery. But when they settled down um, and adopted agriculture, uh, they basically, uh, you know, recapitulated their baskets into pottery. And so the courted wear people um, are in northeastern Europe. And uh, they show up really early, I think like 2900 BC, 2850 BC, uh, as a distinct population. Genetically, they're overwhelmingly Yamnaya, but they have a large minority ancestry of other things. So uh, some of them seem to have like residual amounts of like extra Eastern hunter gatherer, like maybe 5 or 10%, something like that. But the main thing to note about the corded ware is they seem to have swallowed whole the globular amphora culture of, of Poland, uh, of Eastern Poland. And this is the last great Neolithic culture. Uh, it descends from ancient early European farmers that descend themselves from Anatolian farmers uh, that arrived in Europe, you know, like whatever, in Greece, like 9,000 years ago or even earlier. 
um, and in Northern Europe, like, like 6,000 years ago, a little earlier than 6,000 years ago, like maybe seven. In any case, uh, so these are Neolithic people. Uh, they're the last ones before basically being swallowed up by the Yamnaya, who became the corded ware. Um, it looks like um, the vast majority of Europeans today that have this Indo-European ancestry, uh, they have globular M4 ancestry. Uh, the globular M4 just were absorbed into these European populations, these European Indo-European populations. Probably mostly women, probably mostly female mediated. Uh, probably the males were so I two is a haplogroup that was dominant among the globular amphora, and it's really really low frequency now in Poland. Uh, what's high frequency is R one A. Earlier there was some R one B as well. Uh, these are Indo European lineages. So Indo European men came in, uh, Yamnaya men came in from the Pontic Steppe, uh, and they basically bowled over the last farming societies here in Northeast Europe, created the corded ware. Uh, this is the earliest uh, non steppe Indo European population in the woodland zone. Uh, you know probably past practicing agro-pastoralism. I want to be clear that uh, uh, these people were kind of primitive, to be honest. They're barbaric. Um, you know, the, the villages, the vast villages and the beautiful pottery and all these things that you see in, in Romania with the last Neolithic cultures and the vast megaliths. Like J.P. Mallory, a uh, great Indo-Europeanist, told me, um, you know, the archaeology of the early Indo-Europeans in Europe, of the Yamnaya, Corded Ware, all these, you know, people, um, is focused on um, uh, on pottery and burials, because that's what they got. <laughs> so I think they probably lived out of wagons. Um, they didn't really create permanent villages. They probably had some, you know, simple huts, but you know, they destroy. They were destroyed very easily. In contrast, like the Neolithic people, they had a phase where they lived in these vast long houses, uh, patrilineal lineages. Um, and uh, you know, in Romania, Moldova, uh, there was a vast village culture that produced uh, beautiful pottery. Uh, just look it up. Um, again, it's in some of my Substack posts. But uh, anyway, so you know, you have this population in Europe, and this corded ware population seems to have a you know, and we don't have like perfect sampling. Um, like for example, their Y chromosomal lineage is totally different than the Yamnaya, and so it looks like there was some sort of turnover, or there were different branches that were previously unsampled. It's R1A, not R1B. Um, later, they move westward. And it looks like um, they mixed with Neolithic people in Western Germany in the Rhine River Valley, and that arose, and from that arose the next great Indo-European uh, population in Europe, and that's the Bell Beakers. Uh, and the Bell Beakers push into France by like I think like twenty six, twenty five, fifty BC, and then uh, into Britain after twenty five, Spain by like twenty four hundred, twenty three, Italy a, maybe a little later, but similar period. And so they bring this steppe ancestry all across Europe. It's found in Basques. It's found everywhere. And so, but they were not corded where. They were somewhat different. Uh, they had a different Y chromosome that indicates they're a different cultural group, I think. Um, and probably, you know, if I had to bet, like Bell Beakers, you know, they gave rise to Italic, Celtic languages, that sort of thing. I don't know about the Germanic. Um, it could be a mix of some sorts of Western corded ware with Bell Beaker. Uh, corded ware cultures, though, I mean, probably. Balto-Slavic and Indo-Iranian for sure, the old classical corded ware. And so as I said, some of them went eastward and became the Sintashta, became Indo-European. So, so this, is, this is the big story, in my opinion. Um, it's most of the story. Um, so that hasn't changed by these new papers. Uh, what has changed is, um, I think it's filled in some details about Armenian, Greek, uh, the Paleo, you know, Illyrian, Paleo-Balkan languages. Uh, Albanian is the remnant, but there were definitely others. Uh, maybe Tokarian. Uh, there's evidence, I think, um, it's still circumstantial, but there's a fair amount of evidence now that Tokarian, which is probably the next outgroup after Anatolian, um, it was spoken, you know, in Xinjiang, uh, in, in China, as late as like around 900 AD. Um, probably Tokarian uh, is descended from the Afanasivo, uh, who were this like, you know, Eastern Yamnaya branch 5,000 years ago. And so that's why it's distinct, right? But, uh, you know, in terms of the other groups, um, with Armenian, um, basically uh, what Lazaridis et al. are claiming, and the evidence for the Armenian in the paper is very strong. It looks like the Armenians have step ancestry. The early people in Armenia, they might not have been Armenian themselves. Um, you know, whatever. Like, it's post-Urartu, right? They're, they're, the new Indo-Europeans show up in the region of southern Caucasus, eastern Anatolia, and they have step type ancestry. They have eastern hunter-gatherer ancestry. Um, and, uh, you know, that ancestry drops over time. Um, from the late Bronze Age 
that's fine. I think that what's happening here is like this is a highly dense zone. There's that mixture, and so the step ancestry is flow is being diffused everywhere. In any case, these people they have R one B lineages that are clearly Yamnaya. The Yamnaya have a very distinct R one B lineage that's different than the common one in Western Europe uh, that spread with the bell beakers. So it looks like these are not from corded ware people. So the corded ware is the is the branch that went right to the north. Subscribe at Razib.com to hear the rest of it. Thank you.